esto ya está acabado, ustedes lo saben, aquí nadie apoyará al ruso, ya que no es gente de nadie, no tiene respaldo, ya que no traigan con mentiras a sus pistoleros. Joaquín, Joaquín, tisk, tisk, tisk. Not only did you let a woman be the downfall of you, uh, when Sean Penn and uh, that broad got you caught up, uh, you may have be causing a woman to let be the downfall of your sons. Last week, the sentencing of El Chapo's wife, Emma Coronel, which has had a strange lack of coverage by the US media, considering how much they loved to cover her during her husband's trial, and that she appeared on the insane VH1 reality show, Cartel Crew, uh, in June, Emma Cornell herself pled guilty to conspiracy to distribute narcotics and financial crimes, and she was about to be sentenced uh, at, at two weeks from now. She could have got life. Some people were saying she's going to get 10 years, um, but uh, it was delayed. And probably that's because she's going to give inf much information as she can on Los Chapitos, El Chapo's sons, who are the ones who are, uh, as I talked about in the last cartel thing, banning El Mayo's, uh, El Mayo for control. The federal government made the vague statement that, quote, in light of other obligations that have arisen in the interim and the nature of this case, the parties believe that additional time is necessary to adequately prepare for sentencing. Among the negotiations to avoid prison for life is that Emma Coronel talks about the modus operandi of the Chapitos, the sons of Chapo Guzman, who are not her sons, of course, they're about her age. Uh, and Joaquin, of course, was the leader of the Sinaloa cartel. Emma Coronel was his teen bride, her uncle was uh, Nacho Coronel, the so-called uh, Crystal King who may or may not be dead. And uh, people th say that she could, quote, jeopardize her husband's children to serve life imprisonment in exchange for her only spending a few years in prison. This was assured by the Mexican weekly trial uh, or Mexican weekly paper that cited sources of the Department of Justice who pointed out and provided information about the case of the former beauty queen and influencer. And Emma told them that information would be expected from her about the modus operandi, the operating procedures of Ivan Guzman Salazar, Salazar and Ovidio Guzman Lopez alias El Raton, or Nuevo Raton, her another son Jesus Alfredo Guzman, and Joaquin Guzman Lopez, the four of them are known as Los Chapitos. So again, Emma Coronel's sentencing hearing was postponed for 30 days as announced by the federal court of the District of Columbia. And I'm sure she's working behind the scenes to throw somebody under the bus in exchange for herself. Quote, the United States with the agreement of Jeffrey Lickman and Marielle Colon Miro, lawyers for the defendant, Emma Coronel, respectfully postpones for 30 days the sentencing hearing scheduled for September 15th. So as of now, Emma Coronel's fate and who she's gonna tell on is still a mystery. After June, last June, 10th when she turned herself in, there's been four months of negotiations with prosecutors uh, and it was thought that her lawyers reached an agreement for the former beauty queen to plead guilty to three charges against her for conspiring to drug traffic and money laundering and she landed at the airport in Washington DC and was taken into custody but apparently she probably tried to play the game that most people do and not really give good information, give old information, but the feds want relevant information because with every passing day, of course, the operations she knew about are probably changing. Now, because uh, Emma is a U.S. citizen, like the twin daughters she had with El Chapo, Emma Coronel could remain in the United States when she served uh, her sentence under the protection of the department of justice in some sort of 
witness protection program like the Flores twins, other big uh, people who told on uh, her husband as long as she cooperates because she don't want to go back to Mexico. And who knows, she could end up a big reality star. Now, another famous uh, Mexican associated with the cartels, boxing great Julio Cesar Chavez, said he first tried cocaine after he defeated Puerto Rican legend Hector Macho Camacho on September 12, 1992 to go 82-0. Chavez recently told Mexican journalist Jordi Rosado that he gained access to the party drug while meeting a host of Mexican drug lords at an undisclosed location. Of course, he hadn't been, you know, to go from zero to 82 and 0, he certainly wasn't a drug user. But that night when El Chapo, El Mayo, El Garo Palma, El Azul, a very important and secretive uh, go-between, and Amado El Senor de Cielos, the god of the skies, Amado Carrillo, the guy who supposedly died in plastic surgery, and even the Ariano Felix brothers of Tijuana were all present when Chavez became 82-0 after defeating Camacho in Las Vegas, and he went back to Mexico, and they came to congratulate him on the victory, but he said he told them to go to hell because they didn't have cocaine for him. Uh, I guess he had picked up the habit right uh, around the time he beat Camacho, and he ended up blaming cocaine for, the, for his first defeat against Frankie Randall on January 29th, 1994, which stopped his streak of 90 consecutive victories. Uh, uh, he said Joaquin, El Chapo, Guzman, El Mayo, and El Guerrero, and El, El El Zul. So down in Mexico, the drug lords had a big uh, celebration for his win over Hector Macho Camacho. Uh, and according to Chavez's own account, he was demanding cocaine from El Mayo, El Azul, El Chapo, and they didn't have any, but they, they sent out their guys to bring some back. And uh, so he, he said he told them all to, quote, go to hell because he didn't have enough cocaine from them, and the drug lords were only worried about asking him questions about the fight. Well, gee whiz. Uh, remember Julio Cesar Chavez, one point considered the greatest boxer of all time. Like I said, he went 90 and 0. He had beaten Camacho, a Puerto Rican legend. Chavez said there was about 1,000 years worth of jail time the day I defeated Macho Camacho. And they all wanted to meet me and I was standing in the middle. Uh, all of them were talking about how the Macho Camacho fight uh, played out until I got upset. All I wanted was cocaine. There were about 300 armed bastards there, but nobody had coke. So I told them, since nobody brought coke, you can all go to hell. The drug lords abided by uh, their national treasures demands and sent their henchmen out to fetch enough yayo to continue the celebration. So apparently, uh, first used cocaine, I guess, right the night after he beat Camacho in September of 1992, and then a few days or a week later, he was down in Mexico and the drug lords were having a party for him, and he had already developed a big affinity to it. Now, you certainly don't get to 82 and 0 by being on coke, but at that point, he had accomplished a lot in life, and I guess he was feeling overconfident, and uh, he demanded drugs from them, and, and they brought them, and it, it proved to be, maybe not his downfall, but it marked a decline in Julio Cesar Chavez's um, dominance in boxing. Remember, he went on to lose to Floyd Mayweather. Now, the fight over Camacho was for the uh, super lightweight championship, and it was his 82nd consecutive uh, victory. Chavez told the interviewer that while he has always been open about his ties to the infamous drug lords, he eventually forged the relationships with some of the world's, he eventually forged the relationships with some of the world's biggest drug suppliers because he had no other choice. Guys like that come around and want to make friends, it's hard to say no. The friendships came along with gifts of drugs and jewelry, which he was sort of forced to accept. Quote, so they would send for me, and if I didn't go, they would take me. So it was better to be friends than enemies, he said.
That's why I'm alive, because I never got in their business. They knew I didn't dedicate myself to that type of gossip. I was all about the sport. Francisco Ariano Felix, who founded the Tijuana Cartel, or the Ariano Felix Cartel, as it was also known, uh, was, was one of his first buddies, and he gave him um, a piece of jewelry that he still has, a diamond uh, boxing glove pendant that the drug lord gifted him. He also had a friendship with El Chapo. So about two weeks after this um, party for the Mexican boxing champion, uh, the cartel system started to fall apart, or the existing one started to fall apart there. There was a big fallout, that's when the murders really started. Chavez said, I was sort of caught in the middle. I was very good friends with the Ariano Felix brothers because I met uh, Francisco through them. He was, he was their, his first good friend in the narco world. And that guy was, ended up being killed in 2013. Like I said, he had gifted Julio Cesar Chavez a pair of diamond boxing pendants worth a couple hundred grand, which he still has. So these post-party, uh, post-fight parties were the first times Chavez tried cocaine and um, you know, he held out a long time, but it, it, it gives a glimpse of how his life and career started to spiral out of control because of cocaine usage. When I fought with Macho Camacho, it was crazy. I felt that I had already won everything. I already had more than $20 million in the bank. I had yachts. I had a private plane. I had mansions. Uh, well, I had everything that a human being wishes to have in life. But sometimes I felt lonely. I was always surrounded by lots of people. I couldn't walk in the street because people were harassing me. So at this point in his career, he's at considered the best boxer pound for pound in the world, but then the, the uh, combined effects of mixing alcohol and cocaine would begin to take their toll on his professional and personal life. It led to multiple sleepless nights in which the married boxing champ partied and slept with numerous women in Mexico. And uh, Julio Cesar Chavez remembers overdosing many times on cocaine. So by the time he fought Floyd Mayweather, he had a drug and alcohol problem. He had one incident where he was rushed to a local hospital after throwing up blood. Um, and when he regained consciousness, he placed a cocaine order with some of his flunkies and it was brought right to the, to the very hospital room where he was at for basically, I don't know if he's ODing, but his stomach was messed up from doing so much coke and drinking so much. Uh, Chavez remembers being on cocaine for a month before his first loss as a boxer, professional boxer, to a guy named Frankie Randall on May 7th, 1994 at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. And that ended his 90 win streak. He only decided to cut off using the drug three days before the fight so he could clear his system out. So you know, for the, for the pre-fight drug test prior to the weigh-in. So, you know, his training must not have been much. He did say this, I had kept winning up to then because I was such a good fighter, but when I finally lost to Frankie Randall, it was a very sad thing to be honest because I, uh, because I realized what I was really worth. Because after I lost, I looked around me and I saw people crying and I said, bastard, I lost. So who knows what Julio Cesar Chavez's career could have been without him picking up a late career uh, cocaine affinity. Um, he went on to lose to Floyd Mayweather. He probably was not as good as he could have been. And uh, Emma Coronel looks like she's clutching for straws to keep her time as minimal as possible. And the most valuable straw she probably has to clutch for our El Chapo sons, Los Chapitos. So that's what's going on south of the border, a tale of a Mexican celebrity who kind of, I mean, I don't know if he felt victim to them, but he felt victim to the scene. He wanted to party and try cocaine after a lifetime of working hard, being a boxer and austere. And then you have a, a teenage girl plucked from a beauty contest who had an uncle that was 
big in the cartel who, who married the boss, and I'm sure she doesn't want to do 20 or 30 years. Los Drogas Americano.